Hey guys, this is John. We're going to have a look at Game 5 of the 2018 World Chess Championship. Fabiano Caruana back with the white pieces. And again, he opens with e4, third time this match. And Magnus sticks to his guns as well. He plays a Sicilian defense. And we have another Roslimo variation. So still an open question as to what Magnus had in mind if Fabiano goes for the open Sicilian. But Fabiano is content to repeat this variation. g6. And now in games 1 and 3, Fabiano took on c6, the immediate capture, doubling black's pawns. But this time he castles, playing it a little more flexibly. Magnus plays bishop g7, and Fabiano plays rook e1. And now it seems that Magnus does not want to give Fabiano the opportunity to play e5. In all these games, he's tried to prevent white from playing e5, advancing in the center and blocking this bishop. So in this position, knight f6 is the most popular move, but... After e5, knight d5, knight c3, there's quite a few games, over a thousand games according to my database from this position. And maybe, maybe Magnus is a little uncomfortable with this situation and is just preferring to avoid it. So he therefore plays e5, which is also uh, played a fair amount. Now when you play a move like e5, you set up two pawns on the fifth rank, two pawns on the same rank with one square in between. You have to keep in mind that that could be a weak square in the future, and it could especially be a good outpost square for one of your opponent's knights. So you have to keep that in mind if you're going to do that. It's not always advised. Uh, what does black gain in playing this move? Well, he has excellent control over d4, and also the knight can be developed to e7 if Magnus prefers. So now Fabiano played a move that looks shocking at first, but it is known, and I believe it was known to Magnus as well. And I didn't see this game live but when I was playing through it on the app, uh, the Chess24 app, that is, I, I knew that this move would probably be the thumbnail for a ton of YouTube recaps because <laughs> it's a striking move. It's B4 in the style of a wing gambit. So white is offering a pawn. And white is trying to generate an initiative with this move. Black has the option of taking it either way, and I think black definitely should take this pawn. Uh, on the other hand, if white took on C6... Black could take with the D-pawn. This looks similar to the first couple of games, games one and three. But we're going in a different direction this time. B4, enterprising play. Fabiano searching for the initiative. And Magnus takes with the knight. So another possibility, C takes B4. And White's idea is to follow with A3. In just a couple games that I saw from this position, there was a game played in 1971 in Mar del Plata with Henrique Mecking playing the black side. Uh, Grandmaster, and he played B takes A3, but I just included this little snippet to kind of illustrate what White is going for. And his opponent, uh, Schweber, played Knight takes A3, and the game went Knight GE7, Knight C4, and Mecking castled. But I think here, if White had played Bishop A3, White enjoys excellent compensation for a single pawn. You can see that White has very active minor pieces. It's hard for Black to move the D pawn. There is pressure against e5, pressure against both knights. I would not want to play this position as black. The bishop on c8 is still locked in. So this is sort of what white is going for. This pressure that could yield tactics or a win of material. On the other hand, after c takes b4, a3, there was this other game uh, played by Alexander Grishuk with the black pieces that I saw several people, people referencing. It was from uh, Paris in 2017, so played last year. And Grishuk played b3, which seems like a smarter idea, offering the pawn back, but not allowing white to rapidly develop. And that conforms to this rule that I've mentioned to you guys many times, if you've watched my videos. When you're up against a gambit, a lot of times it makes sense to take the first pawn, but not take the second pawn. That's a rule of thumb, and, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all rule, but something to keep in mind. If you take the second pawn, you're already spending a lot of time moving multiple pawns or the same pawn multiple times, or even a piece if you're taking the pawn with a piece. And you might be falling too far behind in development. So, you know, b3, even though black is moving the pawn, it's going to slow white down because c takes b3, white's pieces are blocked. I like Grishuk's choice in that game. I don't think black is doing all that bad here. But Magnus thought for a little bit. He thought for about five minutes, and he played knight takes b4. And Fabiano played this very quickly up until about move 14, whereas Magnus played at a more measured pace. He was spending... Uh, like one to seven minutes per move for the next eight moves or so. So this led many people to speculate whether uh, Magnus was surprised by this opening. And it does seem like Magnus knew this line. Maybe he was trying to recall his preparation. Or Peter Svidler in his Chess24 recap 
said potentially Magnus was trying to bait Fabiano into overextending or playing too optimistically by almost like feigning weakness as if he was not prepared for this opening. So just a theory, but something to keep in mind. So Bishop B2 was played. Oh, I also wanted to mention, so there was this game that I was referencing in my recaps for game one and three, this Fisher versus Spassky game from their 1992 rematch. And back a couple moves, if after e5, bishop takes c6, b takes c6 had been played. Uh, this was, in fact, the continuation of that Fischer versus Spassky game. And Fischer, too, played this b4 move. This was this queenside lever that I was referring to when I was talking about games one and three. And he ended up winning a beautiful game. So I just wanted to reference that. If you want to look that game up, it's well worth your time to play through, especially if you're interested in this wing gambit stuff. But let's return to our game. Knight takes b4 was played. And Fabiano plays bishop b2, developing and attacking the pawn on e5. Magnus plays a6, attacking the bishop. And now Fabiano plays a counterattacking move, a3. Uh, if he retreats the bishop, then you know most likely he'll drop somewhere like f1 or maybe c4. But that's probably not going to put enough pressure on black's position. And I think black could return the knight to c6. Makes a lot of sense, even though we are moving the knight again defend e5, and try to go about developing. Uh, this bishop on c4 is even prone to attack with b5 later on. So that's not exactly how white wants to play. White is hoping to uh, increase the pace of the game here while white has the development lead. White is already castled. So, you know, Fabiano plays this counterattacking move a3, but that's fully in the spirit of the variation. Magnus captures on b5. Fabiano captures on b4. Now there's this open a file, so the rooks are quickly traded. And now Magnus plays d6, and this is this is known. This has all been played before. There are a few games in the database where Black prefers to take on b4 and gets the triple isolated pawns. The only thing worse than double isolated pawns is triple isolated pawns. Uh, and indeed, I think White's a little bit better here. White can take on e5, and yeah, there's a few games from here, but I, yeah, it looks unpleasant to play for Black. These pawns are pretty a pretty big eyesore. Uh, although black is still up a pawn here if we do a quick material count. Yeah, seven pawns versus six pawns. But probably not wise for black to go into this. I think this pawn on b4 will probably be lost in the future. So Trebishop takes a1. Magnus plays this quite intelligently. He plays d6. And after b takes c5, he doesn't pause to recapture. He just plays knight e7 because he wants this pawn on d6 to hold the pawn on e5. Fabiano plays queen e2. Note that white could take on d6. And there's a line that I saw several people analyzing after queen takes d6, d4, trying to break in the center. e takes d4, bishop takes d4, castles, bishop takes g7, queen takes d1, rook takes d1, king takes g7. Relatively forced. White is a tiny, tiny bit better here, but now material is equal. I think the chances of a draw are extremely high if this were to happen. So Fabiano probably knew about this possibility, but didn't want to simplify the position that early. So he plays queen e2 instead, targeting the pawn on b5. Magnus played b4. And now here Fabiano plays queen c4. Again, still playing pretty fast. It's also possible to play queen b5 check, which I think is a more appealing option, honestly, because after knight c6, c takes d6, queen takes d6, white can continue building in logical style play d3 and after black castles play knight bd2 the engine says this position is pretty close to equal i think it was giving bishop e6 or queen back to c7 but uh material is level but white has easier play it seems to me knight c4 is a big idea bringing the knight up and trying to put pressure on e5 white can move this bishop maybe swing the rook over to a1 i think a, a player of magnus's caliber can definitely defend this as black but there's more play here the queens remain on the board. You'll see the queens get swapped in the game continuation. So I would prefer to play it this way. But instead, Fabiano targets the pawn on b4 in a different way. He plays queen c4. And Magnus plays excellently here, these next few moves. He plays queen a5. Great active defense. This is why many people were speculating that maybe Magnus was trying to bait Fabiano into playing something like queen c4, maybe not expecting Magnus to come up with the following sequence. But queen a5, played by Magnus, and great move. It 
not only attacks c5 a couple times, but also takes a look at this undefended bishop on a1. C takes d6. Yeah, and Fabiano began thinking a little bit right around here. And now bishop e6, so not moving the knight yet, but instead attacking the queen. So the queen has to move. And Fabiano played queen c7. It's possible to move the queen back, queen e2. But after knight c8, there's nothing stopping black from castling and regaining the pawn on d6. Note that this bishop is still under attack. Uh, and white cannot take on e5, even though they have two attackers, the queen is doing a good job of laterally defending the pawn with the help of the bishop on g7. So, you know, something like bishop e2 castles, and yeah, black should be fine here, being able to play knight takes d6 soon. Also, white has to watch out for queen a2. So bishop e6, queen c7 was played, and now we get a queen swap. Queen takes c7, d takes c7. Knight c6. Note that the queen trade is is forced here. Uh, Black's not going to be playing queen takes a1 because white is threatening queen takes e7 mate. So we get a queen trade. White's pawn is one square from promotion, but black easily has that defended. And Magnus plays knight c6. He's fortifying e5 before going about trying to corral this pawn. The bishop can hold the pawn, so no big deal. And now Fabiano played c3. Uh, Peter Spidler's recap on chess 24 for this game is excellent. And at this stage, I just wanted to say that he goes into the weeds in quite a few interesting variations that were possible in the game, starting right around here. Uh, he looks at this move, rook d1, and I really don't have anything to add to his wonderful analysis. It's pretty phenomenal to see a 2700 plus player like Peter Spidler, who's also extremely lucid and good at explaining his thoughts. So if you're interested in what would happen after Rook D1 and also just the coming moves in this game in general, I highly recommend that you check out Peter Spidler's analysis. Like I said, I can't add much to it. I would just be quoting his analysis and or quoting Stockfish. So I'm going to defer to his excellent video. Uh, but after Rook D1, he looks at King D7, D4. And now there's two possibilities, B3 or Bishop G4. Again, if you want the details on that, there's some pretty phenomenal lines. Go check that out. But rook d1 was possible. It doesn't seem to bring an advantage even there. Fabiano preferred c3. So trying to get black to take so he can speed up his development, possibly develop the knight here, because you can see that the knight on b1 is hurting for squares due to the cramping influence of the pawn. So b3, but now Magnus plays king d7, and that's a nice move to get coordinated. He's not worried about having his king in the center because the queens are off the board. That's often a good rule you can use to judge whether it makes sense to keep your king in the middle of the board. So brings his king within striking range of this pawn and frees up his rook. Fabiano takes on b4. And Magnus plays rook a8. He swings the rook all the way over. Now note that taking on b4, trying to get this pawn back, would be premature because white has the option of taking on e5. For instance, bishop takes e5, bishop takes e5, knight takes e5, check, king takes c7. And black is down a pawn here. So doesn't make sense to go for this yet also this d4 d5 idea is going to be nice for white so magnus holds off and he plays rook a8 bringing the rook into the game with tempo on the bishop here and now at this moment fabiano spent over 30 minutes on his next move and i have a note in my notes to this game in all capital letters he took off his blazer at this point <laughs> i saw a gif of this move on twitter and yes i said gif not gif <laughs> But he took off his blazer, and that's usually an indication that a player is serious. Like, they're, okay, like now the fight is on. I might have to start making some tough decisions because, again, he had been playing relatively fast in the opening. A little bit slower right around here, but now spent over half an hour. And he played bishop c3, which probably is the best move. Uh, it's a little awkward to put the bishop in between the pawns here and take away the natural square for the knight. But you'll see that this bishop move actually paid off for him in a little bit. So Magnus took the pawn on c7 with his king. Now, note that after bishop c3, white is up two pawns here, but the c7 pawn was probably always going to drop. So white still retains a pawn advantage, but black has the pair of bishops and a more active position. You know, in particular, this rook on the a file, black's nice knight on d4, looking at the b4 pawn and also controlling the d4 square. That allows black to maintain dynamic equality here and in many cases win the pawn back. So... Fabiano played d3 after pro, um, or no, sorry, not prolonged thought. Bishop c3 was the long think, but he played d3. 
Uh, note that something like b5 is probably not wise because this pawn could get overextended. Knight d4 and yeah, I think this the life expectancy for the b pawn is not great for white. So d3. And now Magnus went into the tank here. We're on move 20, so just halfway until the first time control. And he played a move that probably squanders his winning chances. Uh, he played king b6, but many analysts were looking at b5. Blockading white's b pawn. And you'll see king b6, the problem with that move is that it allows white to reorganize with a gain of time. Whereas b5 would have forced Fabiano to make some uncomfortable decisions. Again, white is up a pawn here, but there are certain weaknesses, b4 and d3. And it seems like black is bound to win one of those pawns back and or keep a lot of pressure on white's position. There's nothing immediate, um, but I once again will refer you to Peter Spidler's analysis of this position because it's excellent. Just a couple ideas that black has is rook d8 trying to go after the pawn this way, possibly rook a3 if this knight ever moves. If white were to play a move like knight bd2, rook a3 could be a nice infiltration, attacking the bishop, and if the bishop were to move the pawn behind. Black could play a fortifying move like f6 to defend e5 and then look to play bishop f8, recycling the bishop back to its original square but trying to gang up on the b-pawn. Again, if you're interested in how this works out, check out that other video. But Magnus plays king b6, and now Fabiano comes up with an excellent reorganization. So king b6, Magnus's idea is to play king b5 and try to eventually regain the pawn like this. So a plus king activity for black, but... Bishop d2 is a nice way to deal with this. And after Magnus played rook d8, uh, note that king b5 can already be met by knight c3 check, which is somewhat similar to the game. But after rook d8 trying to target this d3 pawn, Fabiano gives this useful check on e3. Magnus continues forward with his king. And now knight c3 check. So white is able to finally get this knight into the game, the game with a gain of time. King takes b4. Knight, now knight d5 check. And it looks like these last couple moves have been, you know, white taking a loss, taking an L. Uh, just gave up the pawn on b4 and is now offering to give up another pawn if black takes twice on d5. But the point is rook b1 check is coming and white is going to gather that pawn on b7. And that is indeed what happened. This, These last few moves have been fairly forcing. So bishop takes d5, pawn takes d5, rook takes d5, rook b1 check. Here, Magnus has a choice of where to put his king. He played king c3, also possible to play king a4. A few people were looking at. And then after rook takes b7, play this nice move rook b5. Uh, note that white is attacking the pawn on f7, but rook b5 all but forces a draw because the rook is under attack. Also, the back rank is threatened, so white doesn't have time to play this. They're going to lose. Checkmate in a couple. So yeah, if rook b5 was played, there would be a trade. It's four versus four. If white attempts to go after one of these pawns, uh, f5, knight takes h7, black can always get the pawn back, knight b4, black's not going to lose this position. So instead, rook b1 check, king c3 was played. Um, another option, yeah, it's fine to move the king to c3, rook takes b7. So once more, we have four versus four. Very unusually active, active king for black, but it doesn't affect... The result of the game at all. Uh, Magnus still needs to be a little bit careful here because of the f7 pawn being weak. So he plays knight d8, good move. Simultaneously attacking the rook and defending f7. Fabiano gives a check. King takes d3. And I say that that black needs to be careful because even though now white, white is down, down a pawn, uh, it's possible that there could be a mating net or similar ideas around black's king. So Fabiano now plays this nice move king f1. And if Magnus is not careful, then white might play g4 next and knight e1. So you'll see at this moment, Magnus played h5 in the game, allowing um, a knight g5 move in a second. But if he had played h6, trying to stop knight g5, followed by knight takes f7, then white can play this g4 move I was alluding to. And the threat is, again, let's play something normal looking for black, bishop f8. The threat is to go knight e1 check, king here, and then rook c4 which would force black to play rook d4 and give up the exchange. That would be awesome for white. Note that the knight controls the f3 square, and the pawn on g4 controls f5, so there's no stepping there. 
So Magnus very smartly plays h5, controlling the g4 square. h3, perhaps trying to renew this idea. But now king e4, no g4 because of king takes f3. And Fabiano at this point finally says, okay, I'll play knight g5 check, and I'm going to go after the f7 pawn. King f5, knight takes f7. There is a trade here. Three versus three is all we're left with in terms of pawns. Bishop f6. And now Fabiano played g4 check. This is move 34. And the players agreed a draw because there are not enough fighting resources left. Uh, let's say h takes g4, h takes g4, king e6. Black will definitely not take this pawn because of rook takes f6. But king back to e6. And black's pawns are split, but that makes almost no difference here. The position is dead level. So the game ended in a draw, bringing our score in the match to two and a half points each through five games, all draws. Again, don't panic, guys. I think there will be more interesting chess ahead in the coming games. Magnus now gets two whites in a row, game six and seven, so that will be something to watch out for. Uh, this was a very concrete game and a little bit hard to analyze because I feel let's say the assessment of this position I was referring to if black had continued with b5 is a little over my head. Uh, even analyzing it with the computer, there's a lot of complicated lines here. So that's why I was referring you to Svidler's analysis. Um, would have been interesting to see what would happen though if Magnus had played this because black's long-term chances, even if black doesn't immediately regain the pawn, are pretty pretty promising. But, you know, just a, a net neutral game probably Fabiano showed good preparation, but I don't think Magnus was really hoodwinked, and it seems to me that Magnus was prepared for this. And this type of position that they got is actually right up Magnus's alley, so he wasn't able to win. Good defense by Fabiano, actually, in a position right around here where he was thinking for a long time and had to come up with this, this nice bishop d2 to e3 reorganization. Uh, but, yeah, he was up to the task. Fabiano playing very solid, good, concrete chess. Magnus trying to generate winning chances, but he hasn't really had a lot to work with other than that game one game, which he definitely should have put away. But I'm still very interested in this match, and I think game six and seven, again, with Magnus having white, will be very telling if he can, if he can make anything of it. Maybe we will see an E4 game. We'll see. So thanks for watching, guys, and I will be back again tomorrow with analysis of game six from the World Chess Championship. Bye.